Amen. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the template for a reform line. By the way, can you hear me at the back? Is that a yes or a no? Yes. <laughs> this morning, those at the back, I couldn't hear the presenter speaking. So I want to make sure that you can hear me. So I presume everybody here is familiar with a standard template for a reform line. Often, when we think about those way marks, time of the end, increase of knowledge, formalization, etc. We might come to a point in our understanding where we place an emphasis in our own studies of which way mark is the most important. If you're like me, you probably have noticed that in many presentations an emphasis is placed on the empowerment of the First Angel's message, or 9-11. And this emphasis is so strong because we combine the messages of the First and Second Angel at that way mark, that often we think that the First Angel actually begins to do its work there. But we all know otherwise. We all know that the First Angel arrives at the time of the end. So I want us to think about, in the next few seconds before I give you my thoughts on it, what the most important way mark is in a reform line. So I'll just do a standard template for a reform line. Maybe. So we have the time of the end. An increase of knowledge, formalization, the empowerment, the arrival of the second, the empowerment of the second, and the third. So we could call this close of probation, time of the end, increase of knowledge, formalization, the empowerment. The arrival of the second and the empowerment of the second to E to A three A one E and one A. You'll probably see the increase of knowledge put as an increasing sloping line like this for a long time now. But increasingly, thank you. You may come across presentations where this is no longer being done, and the increase of knowledge is actually being identified as a specific way mark. Sometimes people get confused about that. They think it's some new teaching, but it really isn't. It's just a portrayal of the same truth in a different way. It's just a graphical representation of something different. And the reason why we, I am intending now to put it as a way mark is because we associate the increase of knowledge with a specific year. In the right history, are we familiar with what year that is? Yeah? So in Millerite history, we tend to go with 1831. So let me read this statement to you. Take from the Great Controversy 343, paragraph 2.
you've had enough time to think about what you what you believe the most important way mark is. As you're locating that passage, I'm just going to read paragraph one, just as an introduction. This is chapter 19, Light Through Darkness. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. So I don't know if you've had a chance to find the reference now. 343 paragraph 2. It begins. No truth is more clearly taught in the Bible than that God, by his Holy Spirit, especially directs his servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. So what's clearly taught in this sentence, in the first sentence, is that there's a truth in the scriptures. In fact, there are many truths in the scriptures, but the one that's clearly taught above every other single truth that there is, that you can find, is that God, through the Holy Spirit, directs human beings here on earth in the great movements for carrying through the work of salvation. I understand this to mean the following. If you go to any story, if you go to any parable, what you will find there is an individual, a person who is going to lead God's people in the work of salvation. Or as she quotes it here, a movement. This person, this individual, is being directed by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is being directed by God. And this happens so many times through the scriptures that no other truth is more clearly represented than this. What's a marvel is that if this truth was so clearly presented in the scriptures, why we as God's people have not been able to identify this principle or this concept or this idea until this generation. Until the very end of Earth's history, God's people have really not understood this truth. Men are instruments in the hand of God, employed by Him to accomplish His purposes of grace and mercy. Each has his part to act. To each is granted the measure of light adapted to the necessities of his time and sufficient to enable him to perform the work which God has given him to do. So we know that in each of these great movements, in the plural, that God is going to select men. And each of these men who are instruments in the hand of God, are going to be used by God to accomplish His purpose of grace and mercy. I'm not sure how you understand the term grace, but it has at least two meanings. But I understand grace in the context here to mean power to overcome hereditary and cultivated tendencies, or to put it bluntly, to overcome sin. These men are going to be used to accomplish God's will in his purpose of instructing God's people on how to overcome sin and showing them mercy. To each of these men is granted a measure of light which is adapted to that specific generation or that dispensation, or that story. And it's sufficient for him to accomplish his work from the beginning to the end of that reform movement. We're all familiar with the Millerite history, and you know that that truth can be plainly seen in Millerite history, that to William Miller, the truth that he was given, the work that he was given to do, 
the power that he was enabled to exercise was sufficient to enable him to complete the task from the time of the end to the close of probation. But no man, however honoured of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption, or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. So even though each of these men had sufficient knowledge and understanding to enable them to complete and do their work, to each of these men was not given a full understanding of the great plan of salvation, or as she says, redemption. And redemption means to purchase back something that you already owned before. God already owned human humanity and he redeemed them, which meant he had to pay back that which he already owned. So to each of these men, even though they had sufficient information to perform their work, they were not given the full understanding of the great plan of redemption, or uh, even a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose for God in their own time. Again, you can see that in the time of Christ, you can see that John the Baptist didn't have a full appreciation, a perfect understanding of the purpose of God in his generation. And neither did Miller. Men do not fully understand what God would accomplish by the work which he has given them to do. They do not comprehend in all its bearings the message which they utter in his name. I'm sure we all appreciate that being the final generation, we are required to accomplish this task that no other human being on earth has been called to accomplish. God has raised up a man in this generation as he has in past generations. He always raises a man to do a work. And associated with that man, a movement develops. You and I should understand that in each of those past histories, that even though those men did not understand the plan of salvation in its full bearing for their individual histories, when we draw those truths line upon line in our own history, we should begin to understand the truth in all of its bearings which we're required to do. So I don't know if you've thought about what you think the most important way mark is in this reform line. But I personally think the most important one is this way mark here. The increase of knowledge. Some people would choose another way mark. Some people would agree. But let me briefly explain why I think that is so. Before I do that, I just want us to understand the relationship between the increase of knowledge and the formalisation of the message. I want to suggest that in many ways, these two waymarks are really the same waymark. You appreciate, especially when we go to Millerite history, that William Miller begins to have an increase of knowledge from the time of the end. And by the time he gets to the year 1816, 1818, he's had a conversion experience and he begins to study his Bible and he comes to the firm conclusion that Christ is about to return. In fact, he tells you by the time he gets to the completion of his two years of study in the year 1818, I think we're all familiar with this passage, he says that I come to the solemn conclusion that in 25 years the Lord will wrap up his affairs on this earth 
and the sanctuary will be cleansed. Are we familiar with that passage? So here in the year 1818, William Miller is going to tell you that in 25 years, everything is going to finish. And he says, this is the conclusion of the matter, after two years of intensive study, we come to the conclusion that Christ is about to return in 25 years. He doesn't do much with his studies, as you know, and by the time we get to the year 1831 to 1833, when he begins to publicly preach his message, or what we would call the formalization of the message, is when his message begins to be carried to the world. But I assume we all realize that the conclusion that he comes to in 1818, nothing essentially changes for the period from 1818 onwards. There's no new message that he has to deliver. I'm not sure how many of us... We have light? No, we don't have light. I'm not sure how many of us realise So much light 
was opened up to this movement with the understanding of Ezra 7. And one of the truths that I think has helped us so much is to have a broader, deeper understanding of how we understand line upon line methodology and how we should be applying symbols. So you're probably aware that from that time onward, we began to get dates, first day of the first month, first day of the fifth month, and we would turn those dates into symbols and then do a line upon line study to understand what the varied stories that would have those dates in them would mean to us. Springboarding off those dates, we then came to understand that we could also use time periods as symbols and do studies line upon line using time periods. The time period between the first of the first month and the 30th day of the fourth month is exactly 120 days. And the number 120 becomes a symbol for the history of the priests. All material, hopefully, that we're familiar with. And then we began to see, in a way that we became more confident to express, that we could get Bible verses, chapter numbers, verse numbers, and we could see light and truth in understanding what they meant. Now we've been doing that for quite a while because it's not been, it's, sorry, it has been a long while since we understood from Testament Sins Church Volume 9, page 11, where Ellen White speaks about the fulfillment of Revelation 18, verses 1 to 3, the fall of the towers in New York. We can understand that we could use pagination to help us to understand and clarify truths that we consider to be important. So we are not doing anything that's strange when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. So we're picking up the year 1818, and we're going to see Deuteronomy 1818. And before we read that, the reason why we're doing this is because we're going to see that the Lord has raised up somebody who's going to give a message and if you disobey this person, then the conclusion is going to be that you're going to be lost. At this point here, if you reject this messenger, there is no opportunity for you to be helped or to be saved or to receive mercy. <coughs> Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou wilt say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Then she carries, uh, we'll read to verse 22. When the prophet speak, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which is the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of them. Straight away, you can see that there are two groups that are mentioned here, although you can't mark two groups until you get to the power of the message. We're going to see that in some later studies. But I want us to see, going back to verse 18, that this prophet's going to be raised up here in 1818. And you're required.
required to take heed to what this prophet says. And if you don't, you will die. <coughs> it then goes on to say, And he shall speak unto them, Oh, uh, sorry, one sentence back. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And we can see, hopefully we all know, that when we consider a mouth, <coughs> a mouth serves two purposes. One is to eat, and the other is to speak. Now when we think about eating, invariably we put the eating here at the empowerment of the first angel or 9-11, which is correct. But I want us to see that this prophet has already begun to eat the little book long before the empowerment of the message. So we can mark the eating here in 1818. And the words that he eats, he has to speak. Verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So this prophet is going to begin to eat here, and he'll begin to speak here in 1818 to 1831 when he begins to publicly present his message. <coughs> now this passage here in Deuteronomy 18 is such an important passage that it's quoted in the New Testament. I'm not sure if you know where it's found. But it's found in another portion of Scripture that we often use in this movement which is the famous passage that we use. It's Acts chapter 3. And often when we deal with Acts chapter 3, we go to verse 19. So let's turn to Acts chapter 3. may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So this week I want to deal with the issue of conversion, of repentance, of pardon, of penitence. I want to deal with some of those terms and one that comes up over and over again is the subject and nature of what repentance is and how it works and where repentance is supposed to be placed upon line. So I want us to consider that, verse 19, it talks about repentance and being converted so that your sins may be blotted out and the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. We're not going to focus on verse 19, but we're going to read on. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was presented, or sorry, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. So you can see that Luke is now speaking, Luke is obviously the scribe, he's now going to go take us back to Deuteronomy 18 and he's quoting about this prophet. In verse 19 of Deuteronomy 18, if we just turn back to Deuteronomy 18.
He tells you the consequence of not listening to this prophet. So Moses says in verse 19, It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So this idea of requiring of him, Peter in Acts chapter 3 is going to explain exactly what that means. We're in, we just read verse 22, we're going to read in verse 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So, if you do not listen to this prophet, then it's going to be required of you. Just going back to Deuteronomy 18, in verse 20, he explains it quite clearly. For the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, verse 20, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So you have a choice to listen to a false prophet or the true prophet that God has raised up. And if you don't hearken to this true prophet, it says it will be required of you. Now it talks about life that's going to be required, you're going to be destroyed. Now we know that the life of a human being is contained where? In the blood. The life is in the blood. So when it talks about requiring of him, what's actually been spoken of is a person has rejected the atonement or the redemption or the work of Christ or Christ's blood. Now, if you're not prepared to put your hand upon the Lamb, transfer your sins to the Lamb, take the Lamb's life, and have that blood substitute for your blood, then what's going to be required of you? Your life. Now, when we speak about our reform life, correctly so, we speak about waymarks, events, and often it can become quite an intellectual exercise about what is happening and what is not happening. But I want us to remember when we read Great Controversy 343 paragraph 2, that the whole purpose of this great movement is to redeem God's people. It's the redemption of God's people that is the task at hand. God's people are in a lost since in condition, and they need redeeming. Remember when we spoke this morning from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, we read from pages, we actually just read pages 6, paragraph 1 and 2. We read Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It speaks about the poor in spirit. And you remember that the poor in spirit are those people who are lost and undone. It's no good thing to be poor in spirit, even though you have the potential of being blessed. God's people are lost and they're in need of redemption and that's the purpose of the raising up of this prophet and the whole exercise of this reform line. So if you don't accept the conclusion of this prophet here at the increase of knowledge, what you're in essence saying is that you're not prepared to transfer your sins to the sins, uh, sorry, to Christ and let him be your sin bearer. So all of this is sanctuary language that Adventists should understand and be familiar with. But what we're seeing is that this process of salvation is clearly portrayed upon a line. You can see it from the Great Controversy reference. You can begin to see it now from the raising up of the prophets and the increase of knowledge and how a rejection of him requires you to keep hold of your blood and die in your sins if you're not willing to accept his message. 
I want to suggest that after the increase of knowledge, of course the prophet begins to speak. But everything after that is just an embellishment or a clarification or more detail of the message that was given right at the beginning of the reform movement. Really there is no new truth. All it is is a refinement, further explanation of what is about to happen. I don't know if you would think, why would that be? Why would it take 25 years, in our history even longer, for things to progress and not for things to wrap up so quickly? I don't have an answer to that question, but I want to suggest that the sin problem in each and every one of us is so deeply rooted, it takes an extraordinary amount of work, a miraculous work, to get the sin problem out of us. And that's why it takes so long, so much information, for God to show us how to remove sin out of our life. Sin has caused us so much damage, so many problems, that even when the truth is presented to us, we don't believe it. We actually don't believe the truth that God has presented to us in his word. We find it so hard to accept righteousness by faith. And what I mean by that is if you read some words and you read them rightly or correctly, we find it so hard to believe that God has to give us more and more information, more time to be able to accept his message, accept his truth. Now obviously we also read that these men didn't fully understand what the work that God was trying to do in that particular reform line, in their particular generation, which we're required to do. So not only are we hard-hearted, but there's the a large amount of information for us to assimilate, process, accept, not only intellectually, but also spiritually. So that's why it takes so much time. Now, we've mentioned about repentance. And repentance is a big issue in our reform movement, especially now when we try to understand where we place sin, where we place righteousness, and where we place judgment. There's a shaking in our movement, which all of you need to be aware of, of when the judgment begins, when righteousness begins, and when the sin problem gets dealt with. Now there are people who want to suggest that the sin problem cannot be dealt with in the present situation, in our present time, because it's so deep-rooted in us that it's going to be dealt with in the future. There are some people who are suggesting, no, we need to deal with the sin problem right now. And there are some people who are suggesting that the sin problem got dealt with a long time ago. I'm not sure where you stand in that thinking. Past, present, or future. Over and over again, it, it never surprises me, so it never stops surprising me, because I'm always surprised, why this confusion on this issue. I don't know if we know the definition that generally the movement we use when we deal with the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. But we understand that the gospel message that is being used in this reform life, the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves you, that he can redeem you, buy you back from servitude 
That this gospel message is the prophetic gospel. Yeah, I see many people nodding their heads. That we understand it's the prophetic gospel. But I'm not sure if we understand what a prophetic gospel even is. That's one point that I want us to think about. What is a prophetic gospel? And the other thing I want us to think about, in association with that concept of what the prophetic gospel is, is also I want us to understand what sin is. How do we understand what sin is? Now the classic definition of sin is the transgression of the law. I think we understand that. And I'm not trying to deviate or take us away from that definition. But when we think about the prophetic gospel in comparison to the moral gospel, I want us to think about what is the difference between the two? How would we describe or explain the difference between morality and prophecy? So when we think about morality, what do we think morality means? It comes from the word moral, which comes from the word mortal, which is a description of what? Human beings. Yeah? We're all mortal beings. So when we think about morality, and we think about the issue of sin, or the gospel, or the healing. So if you think about a moral gospel, the person's going to be redeemed. Often we think about the transgression of the moral law. Is that how we would think about that, when we think about morality? The Ten Commandments. So when the Ten Commandments are moral, all of us would say, yeah. yes? Pretty obvious, really, I would think. We all believe in the principle, the rule, that upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Yeah? So, let's turn to Exodus chapter 20. Verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now I want you to think about this. What's the big issue about committing adultery? If you think about virtually every single species here on earth, I think almost every single one, bar for a very, bar very few, there are very few animals that that don't do this. Most males will have a harem of female animals. You know, like a lion will have a pride of uh, female lionesses. Um, any creature will, will procreate many times in the season. They have no concept, no idea about monogamy. One man with one woman. Only human beings seem to have this idea, this concept. So why is that? Why did God only make us, create us, to have a relationship where you have a man with one wife only? What's the purpose of all of that? What's the harm, what's wrong with a woman having multiple husbands or a husband having multiple wives? Because the animal creation does that, and they don't seem to have any problems, they seem to function pretty well. 
They don't have all the diseases that we do. They don't have all the social problems that we do. They function really well. They have lovely communities. And we who claim to have monogamy still have so many problems. So what is marriage all about? Why is it such a moral issue? So I want to suggest that the reason marriage was even given to us was that it was a parable. It was an example of the relationship that God wants to have with a human being. Now we know that, it's not a surprise to us, that our God wants to be such in unity with us that he wants us to be one flesh in total harmony with him, which is all about the concept and the idea of marriage. We understand that. So, when are we to marry Christ? Not on an individual level, but I mean as humanity. Is it a past, present, or a future thing? Some people are not sure, we're a bit nervous. We can, we can, make, we can say something. Future? Everybody agree in the future? Yeah? So how do you know we're going to be married to Christ in the future when it hasn't happened. How do you even know that? You don't, do you? Because it hasn't happened, so you don't know. So you're making a prediction that something's going to happen in the future, which is the definition of prophecy. So I would suggest that marriage is prophecy. Yeah? Can we understand that concept? It's a prophetic test of whether or not you're going to marry Christ sometime in the future if you're going to take heed to this prophet. So let's look at another commandment. Uh, we'll go with another easy one. Verse 8. We won't do the verses. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the Sabbath... Is the Sabbath moral? By default you're going to have to say yes because it's part of the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are moral. So by default you're going to have to say that it is. But often we think about the Sabbath as being a relationship between a human being and God, don't we? And by definition that isn't moral because morality is to do with relationships between two human beings. But here comes the Sabbath, and it's really to do with our relationship between ourselves and our God, which makes it not moral. But Jesus corrects all of that, doesn't he? When he comes to earth and he starts addressing the Sabbath issue in argument or contention against the church leadership, because the church leadership thinks Sabbath is only about a human being and God which makes it not moral, which is not between human beings and human beings. And what does Jesus do, not literally every Sabbath, but in most of the Sabbaths that you can read about, what's he doing? He's breaking Sabbath, isn't he? Yeah? What rules is he breaking? He's doing lots of work, isn't he? He's doing lots of work helping his fellow human beings. So you can see that the Sabbath is indeed a moral commandment because the whole purpose of Sabbath, besides our worship to God, not working in our secular employment, was to go around doing good and helping people. But often we forget about that, we become quite selfish during the Sabbath hours because we want to bunker down to make sure we don't get contaminated with anybody's <laughs> sin problem. Is that right, my brother? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, the Sabbath is a moral commandment, yes? But I thought, 
According to Revelation 14, 9 11, that the Sabbath is another issue. Revelation 14, 9 11 says, Don't receive the mark of the beast. Is that past, present, or future? Future. So we know that the mark of the beast issue is to do with the stamp of Rome's authority compared to the seal of God's authority. And the seal of God is the Sabbath. So the Sabbath test that we're practicing every week is really a prophetic test because it hasn't even started yet. So you've got two testimonies that the Ten Commandments are as much prophetic as they are moral. Can we see that? So on the, test, on the testimony of two, things established, so you could go and work through all Ten Commandments and you would see that every single one of them, even if you can't see it, obviously, has to be prophetic. By definition, the Ten Commandments have to be prophetic. So we can put the Ten Commandments here. So, we teach that the everlasting gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message that will produce or develop two classes of people and then demonstrate them. And we, we emphasise this prophetic testing message or this prophetic gospel and what's the difference between the prophetic and the moral now what happens if you don't listen or obey the Ten Commandments what will happen to you you'll be lost So, you need to keep the Ten Commandments or you'll die. We agree with that? So, you need to obey. <clears throat> so, we'll go with obedience. We're living in the final generation and this movement, the movement that we're in now, is this the church? Is this movement the church? Yes? Threat? I can't hear you speak louder. If you don't speak louder, I can't hear what you're saying. Yes, okay. So, if this movement is the church, what church is it? Is it the church triumphant? Or is it the church militant? So this movement people are saying is the church militant. Yes? Some of them say the church triumphant, so we're not sure. Okay. So let me, let, let me not, we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll come to a conclusion on that afterwards. Some people aren't sure whether we're the church triumphant or the church militant. And I guess the reason is because you look at your next door neighbour or you're sitting next to your spouse <coughs> and you're thinking, this can't be the church triumphant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know why you won't say that. Because <laughs> you want the sinners in Zion to be sifted out. <laughs> so, when the church triumphant is there, whenever that is, it's going to look like what? What's it going to look like? Okay. A terrible army with a banner, yes? And we use that symbol of the banner or an ensign. And an ensign is just a war banner that's lifted up. We see the same imagery brought to view in Ezekiel 37, where you get this great army. What's the characteristics of an army? What do armies have that's characteristic about them which is unique to them and you don't normally find them in any other group? Their unity. 
They're in unity. What does Jesus say? They bear arms. Going into the book of Joel there. Discipline. Okay, so we've already got it. One of them here is that they obey. Yeah? And I, I want to say that it's 100% obedience. 100% obedience. But it's a special kind of obedience. When they're told to jump to their death, what did they say? Yeah, but what did they say? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and what do you say? <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> so this is why you don't think you're a church triumphant, I guess. <laughs> so, when we think about the moral gospel, God's ideal for his people, because we weren't supposed to be militant, were we? I mean, it wasn't God's dream or desire to say, oh, I like militant people, let's, uh, let's have it all together. He wanted a pure church from the very beginning. So, the moral gospel requires 100% obedience without question. Can we see that? The characteristics of the moral gospel. Yeah? So let's come to the prophetic gospel. We don't have charts up here, but I don't know what it's like here, but in most parts of the world, when we think about our message and we interact with our brethren in the church, the issue that comes up over and over again, I'm not sure how much nowadays because maybe things are quieting down. And it's designed this way, by the way, in my opinion. Back in chapter 2, tells us what? It says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Yeah? So this is the back of 2. And it says the vision. I'm not good at grammar. I'm sure you're better than I am. But when the word verb is used in a phrase, it means the definite article. It means a specific thing that's being addressed. So you couldn't say, if I said the cat, all of you should be looking around and you're looking to that cat. So when it says the vision, what vision is Habakkuk talking about when he says the vision? What is the vision that's being spoken about? I'm going to say something, speak out loud. I'm speaking out loud, and my voice goes right to the end. Hazon. The Hazon vision. So, my brother says it's the Hazon vision. Do you all agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. But what vision is it? What vision is the Hazon vision that's specifically being dealt with here? I'll ask a different question. Is the Hazon vision one particular vision? It's multiple visions. So what Hazon vision is being referred to here when it says the vision? Which one is he referring to? We're not sure? Okay. When he's a back alive, do we know when he's alive, when he's living, when he's doing his ministry? We'll do, we'll do it all line here, and we've got the seven kings of Judah, from Manasseh to Zedekiah. Got Manasseh, Ammon, and then we've got Josiah. Manasseh, Josiah, Zedekiah. There are two prophets who are ministering at the same time. One of them is Habakkuk, and the other one is just a little bit later, and his name is Zephaniah. We're familiar with Zephaniah, particularly chapter 1, because it deals with what subject that caused a huge shaking in our movement a few years ago? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. 
dealing with the day of the Lord. That's what that, that's what caused the con one of the controversies in our movement. So Habakkuk and Zephaniah are in this time period. I'll put Ammon here as well. Between Ammon and Josiah. Habakkuk is in this time period. We can't pinpoint exactly when he is. So this is the ministry of Habakkuk and Zephaniah, and they're talking about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Yes? When is that? When is the great and terrible day of the Lord? No, it can't be the Sunday, Lord, because we're in Manasseh to Zedekiah. Yeah? We want to look at the literal before we look at the spiritual. Destruction of Jerusalem. If you read the back of chapter 1, he explains this. In this history, God's people are complaining because... Do you know why they're complaining? They're complaining at God because they say, God, you're so lazy. They actually call God lazy. Do you believe that? They call God lazy. The word in the King James is slack. If you check what the word slack is, it means to be lazy. They said, Lord, you're slack in sorting out the mess, the problem that's in the church. And God says, don't worry, because within one generation, the great and terrible day of the Lord is going to come. And that's here, when Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and destroy the church. Are you okay with that? Okay. And then you get to back in chapter 2 and he says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. So God's telling Habakkuk to write the vision and make it plain upon tables so that everyone can see. Yes? What does Ezekiel chapter 12 say? There's a proverb that says what? All the visions aren't working out as they're supposed to work out, and they're going to be prolonged, which doesn't mean they're going to get pushed out, it means they're never going to happen, really. So all, and when is Ezekiel writing that, by the way? It's before the destruction, before the destruction. So all these prophets are focusing upon this destruction. So. What is the vision that Habakkuk is speaking about? We're still not sure. Okay, so this is Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoiahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Are we okay with that? Yes? Which one of the best places that we can see <coughs> what's going to happen to these three, these three kings and this fourth and this uh, fourth one here? Which which chapter, which book would we go to that, that delineates this history? I'll give it, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. We know that by the time you get to Zedekiah, it's the great and terrible day of the Lord. But before that, the captivity begins, doesn't it? Daniel chapter 1 is back here, in the reign of Jehoiakim. So we know that the punishment is progressive. In fact, what happens here at the beginning? The Nasser is taken captive as an earnest or a down payment or a prediction of what's about to happen. Yeah, we're familiar with that. So you can see here a progressive punishment upon God's people. So where do we find this progressive punishment that's laid out that's going to happen to God's people? Leviticus? Leviticus 26. Do we all understand why my sister said Leviticus 26? Yeah? 
Leviticus 26. This is verse 18. 21. 24. 28. Okay, so this is the seven times. And the seven times is the 25, 20. So what's the vision that the back is going to write? It's the 25, 20. Yeah? So the vision that's on the chart, the 80 43 chart, is the 25, 20. And everything else is extra information. Everything else is extra information. The vision that's on the 1843 chart is the 2520. You can see it quite clearly because the way they structured this chart, they're really clever. Well, they were led by God. There's a column in the middle here. And in the 1850 chart, it's actually boxed off. And this central column begins in the year 677 and ends the year 1843. And everything else, all on this side and on this side, is just extra information. And he has many, many dates here. And the way Ellen White would describe this is that she would say that this vision on the 2520 is the chain. And each of these dates are links in this chain. So the 2300 day prophecy is nothing more than a series of links in the chain of truth or the vision of Habakkuk chapter 2, which is the 2520. So we understand this in our movement, that the 2520 is a, a really important issue. So we will go to someone in the church and say, by the way, you may not have heard about this, but there's this 2520. Alan White spoke about it, never mentioned it by name. It's on the chart, both charts. God's people began to fight against it, just like their ancestors, Ahaz. And we've got beautiful structures to show all of this. And you say to them, you need to... Oh, by the way, you need to tell me to finish because I... Don't know what time. Ten minutes? I've, I lost track of my timing. So you're going to tell them, you need to accept this 2520. And they're going to say, you've never heard of a 2520. And you're going to say, don't worry. Let me read something to you quickly. <coughs> um, we read this this morning. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, chapter, uh, page 6, paragraph 1. So you say this to them, next time they say, you've never heard of a 2520. Read this to them. As something strange in you, these words fell, from the ears of the one, fell upon the ears of the wandering multitude. They're going to say, our pastors never teach this, tell them this. Such teaching is contrary to all they have ever heard from priest or rabbi. So you tell them that. Next time they say you've never heard of a 2520, exactly. You won't ever hear about it from the priests and rabbis, and it's something strange and new. Now let me ask you, whatever Jesus was teaching them, was it strange and new? No. Because Abraham had already heard it. But the priests and Levites, sorry, the priests and rabbis had buried the truth because they were in a money-making scam and they didn't want the truth. I'm not saying our conference is into money-making, but we have our own problems. So, we would say to somebody, you need to accept the 2520, and they'll say, but I eat two meals a day, I'm vegan, and I want to move to the country, and this, and this, and this, and have all these moral, laws that they're adhering to, and you're going to say what? Doesn't matter. Don't care what you do. If you don't accept the 2520, what will happen to you? 
You're going to die. We don't say it so bluntly. We say it's a life and death message. You have to accept it. <coughs> Do we really believe it's a life and death message? <coughs> yeah? Their argument will be, I don't even understand it. Give me time to understand it. Help me to explain, you know, explain it to you. Let's go through some studies. What should you say to them? Yes or no? Yes? No, I say yes. When they inquire, I say yes. So yes, okay, we'll do some more studies that you can decide later. I'd say no. I'd say... Ellen White says that this chart was produced by the Lord. They produced a second chart. In fact, when Ellen White said, spoke about this chart in early writing in 74, do we know when that is? When, she has the, when, when the Lord tells her about this, it's September 1850. When he's telling her about the 1853 chart, he's already preparing them to get the 1850 chart up and running. So, I would say to them, you, you believe in Ellen White, you know that these charts were produced by God, you know what the mistake was, and the 18, uh, sorry, 2520 is tucked here in the 1843 chart, it's tucked here in the 1850 chart, what's your problem? <laughs> I mean, do you believe in Ellen White or you don't? So my answer would be, righteousness by faith. You need to exercise some faith that it's right and everything else afterwards is embellishment. Extra information. You can go to Christic structures, you can go to the seven Judean kings, you can see the relationship between the 25, 20 and the 2300 days and how you get restoration, the 220. There's many, many things that we can understand about the 2520. But the first thing you need to do is to accept it at face value. Because it takes a lot of faith to do that. I think that's how we should be approaching our message. Just as we do with everything else. Now I know it's never that easy to do. And people aren't going to do it, so you have to do all these studies with them. But it's, it's because of our lack of faith. If we really were faithful, probably wouldn't even in this mess. But if we were, we just accept things. So, I'm saying this, the 2520 is all about dates, isn't it? 742, 723, 677, 538, 1798, 1844, 1863, 1989, all dates, all events, you can lay out you can lay them all out in a beautiful line when you're dealing with the 2520. And we say, what do you have to do with the 2520? Obey. 100%. And what we should be telling them is without question. Do you know why they're allowed to ask questions? Why are they allowed to ask questions? Let me ask you this question. Is a Christian allowed to ask questions? It depends. <laughs> is a soldier... Church, is a soldier allowed to ask questions? No. They can ask for some clarification. They didn't, they didn't understand something. I'm not talking about education. I'm talking about questions which they don't like. They don't like the commands and they ask questions. It's not for further clarification. But even if you did that, your general would get pretty upset with you. Because you're supposed to be up to speed. You're supposed to be thinking. So... Moral, prophetic, Ten Commandments, 100% obedience to that question. There's no difference between the two. So the question is, why are these people, our brothers and sisters, allowed to ask questions? 
Everybody heard, everybody's heard of Babylon Jones, obviously. I'm sure you, I'm not sure you really do have. E.J. Wagner did a nice series on the Book of Romans, and um, actually, let me try and find the Bible verse that he quotes that he refers to. Yes, Romans 3.22. Romans 3.22. I'm not going to give the context of this. It's an interesting context. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, but there is no difference. So he talks about there being no difference. Now go to chapter 10, verse 12. Chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon his name. So there's no difference between who? The Jew and the Greek. So who is the Jew? Adventists. And who is the Greek? The Gentiles. So there's no difference between Adventists and Gentiles. Let's go back to Romans 3.22. I'm going to tell you why there's no difference. We read verse 22, now we're going to read verse 20. Uh, we're reading, I'm going to read the last part of verse 22. For there is no difference, verse 23, and he's told you why. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So why is there no difference between the Jew and the Gentile? Because they've all sinned. So God treats the Jew and the Gentile as though they're all heathen. They're all sinners, all lost. Yes? We're going to treat them the same because they're all the same. So in closing, there will be one more Bible verse. So this lost person who's doing all this sin, who's doing all this sin, uh, we're going to Isaiah 118. So we've seen that Adventism and the world are the same. They're both considered to be, considered by God, to be like heathen, in need of salvation, because their profession is worthless. Hence, the reform line. God's people, if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to ask questions. Why? If God says the 25-20, you're 100% obedient without question. But God's people are not Christians. They're lost and undone because they're in their sin. And he treats them like they're Gentiles in need of a saviour. Isaiah 118. This is what God does, or how he relates, to people who are lost. Come now and let us reason together. What does it mean to reason? It means let's dialogue. You can ask me some questions. So I'm going to say the 2520 obey it, you're going to say, explain a bit more about that. Say the Lord, for though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This group of people that he's speaking about, Isaiah, they have their sins as scarlet. They've got their sins on them. Their garments are what colour? Right, red, scarlet. Because they've got sin. They're like Gentiles. They're lost. So when God says, come and I can save you, they're allowed to ask questions. 
Technically, they shouldn't because they claim to be Christians. That's why we can't ask questions. You are required to obey this reform line without any question if you claim to be part of this movement. If you claim to be part of the Church Triumphant. The definition of Christianity is 100% obedience without question, whether it's moral or prophetic. There's no difference. The only people who can ask why are people who are lost, whether they're Adventists or whether they're people in the world, because there's no difference. The only difference between an Adventist and someone in the world is one thing. And the one thing is the sequencing. It's who you go and speak to first. That's the only difference between them. You're required to first speak to an Adventist and then speak to the person who's in the world. That's the only difference between them. When you look at Adventists, you should be thinking, this is a poor, lost sinner in need of help. And that's why we're required to bend over backwards and answer all their silly questions about the 2520. And spend hours and hours explaining to them something that's patently obvious in the scriptures. Because they're like heathen. I say they, them, with the hope that it's not us yeah. in this room. In closing, what's the difference between morality and prophecy? Why did we ever even come up with this invention of using the phrase prophetic gospel or prophetic testing message? Because it's not an inspired statement, you know that. It was, well, I guess, it was invented by the prophet back here, not literally in that time period. What is the difference between moral and prophetic? There's only one difference. And I already explained what it was when we spoke about the vision and all those things. It's events. That's the only difference between the two. And the reason why this is such, so important for us to understand is because when I look at my brother at the back of the room, because I judge people a lot, and I want to check if he's faithful or not, it's extremely difficult for me to use this measuring stick. Because he's very tricky. Aren't you, my brother? They don't know which one I'm talking about, so it's good. <laughs> they hide themselves really well, like Ventis do. You can disguise yourself very really easily. This one, it's not so easy to. Because I'm going to say, 2520 or not? <laughs> Radical Islam or not? <laughs> and I say, what did you eat yesterday? He said, oh, it was nice food and... <laughs> I said, be specific. He said, I can't remember. I said, do you treat your wife nicely? He said, of course I do. But what's the definition of nice? And if I have a camera to know what he's doing, it's very hard for me to point out and judge who he is. But with this one, it's straightforward to see. This is why we have a prophetic gospel. And this is nothing new. Adventists have taught this since the year, not literally, but 1844, when the Third Angel's message became present truth, that at the end of the world there's going to be a test between the Sabbath and the Sunday, it was a prophetic test which was an event. So when the Sunday law happens, and you're going to knock on your neighbour's house, and you're going to say, which day are you going to keep, Sunday or Sabbath? They're going to say, uh, we're not sure. Sabbath, and you're going to say, good. By the way, did you commit adultery last week as well? Are we going to say that? Why not? Because we're only interested in events. Because that's the measuring stick that we're able to identify who's on God's side and who isn't on God's side. I've run out of time. So we're going to carry on our studies. Lord willing tomorrow and then you see in case there are any announcements after we close. Let's close the prayer. <laughs>
I was born in a time period where not only a reform line began, but the reform line of all reform lines, the culmination of all your work with humanity. It's my hope that everybody bowed before you would be so thankful that they too were born in this era. And more than that, you have given each of us the privilege of being priests, the privilege of ushering in the Levites and the Nethanims into your glorious church. Lord, as each of us desires to be part of that work, may we realise the high calling that you have for us. Lord, already in the midst of your people, there is a rejection of the prophet. Lord, help each of us to realise the consequences of not obeying his word. Eternal death. Lord, this truly is a life and death message. Help each of us to realise what the gospel is that you're trying to show us. That you require 100% obedience without question. We thank you, Lord, that you have made this gospel message so plain and so simple that even a child can understand it. That all you require of us is to accept events. Help us to enter into this understanding. Help us to experience it, that it might have a transforming effect upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the great vision that you have given to us, encompassing all the prophecies, all the truths. Please be with us and please bless us this evening. Help us to honour you and to glorify you through these sacred hours of the Sabbath. Give us rest and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.